good examples now bringing uh, up to some comfort level, making a couple of different resource selection functions for um, individual animals, which is, you know, sort of these days, GPS data, you, you are making them per individual animals, um, but then what happens when you've got now 25 resource selection functions? How do you, how do you say something sensible about the population? Projection. Projection. Yeah. yeah. So I was going to say one thing real quick first to, um, before, before moving into that last topic. So several people had questions with trying to develop the available points for the step selection functions. And one of the places that um, I consistently saw that needed just some updating was the resampling piece. So how to get your data into where you've got regular, regularly collected data. Um, and in, in that little, in that loop where I looped over each individual, I had some code that just said, take the median time distance. Ah, good point, you gotta plug, this doesn't work real well if you don't plug your computer into the projection system. It's technical, that's why they do yes. I'm technically challenged, yes. Um, so this, this little piece right here, where I just wanted something to put in there to work. So I put in, take the median time difference for each individual and use that to regularize the trajectory. And then I put a tolerance of either 10 minutes or uh, the maximum of 10 minutes or the median divided by five. What I would say is this is probably where you're going to run into issues and you might wanna modify. Think about how your data are collected and if they're every hour, just go in here and say, I want to resample to every hour and tolerance maybe 30 minutes or something like that. You might want to just, if, just modify these lines to be appropriate for whatever time schedule you've collected your data, okay? That makes, makes sense, but this is where a lot of people seem to get hung up with when they're trying to generate available points. If that doesn't make sense, you can come, you can ask me, email me or stop me after lunch or during lunch or whatever. Okay. So this was a bit of an add-on last year at the end of the workshop when everyone was really spent and I've tried to update it a little bit um, since then to give some thoughts about how do you approach analyzing data when you've got lots of data from multiple animals. So, so far we've seen how to fit models to individual animals. Uh, resource selection functions or step selection functions. But you may want to know, well, are there differences among animals and what's driving those differences? Why, do some, why are some coefficients bigger for some individuals than others? Um, or you may want to figure out how do I pool information across individuals to make some inference at the population level? Okay, so there's different strategies to deal with this. One would be just fit models to the pool data and maybe ignore the fact that you've got data from multiple animals and then see if can, can you fix up the standard errors to, to actually represent or recognize that you don't have independent data but you've got data that are clustered with several observations for each of several animals. Another approach is what you've seen already which is fit a model to each individual animal and then take those coefficients as summaries of the movement behaviors of each of those individuals and then take those coefficients and treat them as new data that you can then analyze. So kind of a, a two-step approach. You could take the mean of the different coefficients to say on average, do individuals tend to select for higher elevations or lower population densities? Or you could take those coefficients and actually model them as a function of individual specific characteristics. So sex of the animal, the age of the animal, things like that, so in a second step. Um, or you could use those coefficients to explore functional response patterns, which um, I'll talk a little bit about here in a second as well. Or you could try right off the bat to try and do everything in one step and fit mixed models, um, which are sometimes talked, uh, referred to as hierarchical models or random effect models, and try and model both within variability and among individual variability all in one step. So how many people are familiar with mixed effect models? Okay, how many people feel like they can interpret them? <laughs> Just curious, so I teach a class in the spring to, I had students from eight different grad programs and we kind of step through, starting from linear regression to mixed models and we get to the mixed models and I 
I, um, I ask how many people have fit mixed effect models, and there's, there's a bunch of hands that kind of go up like, like uh, yeah, I have, but I don't want to admit it. And so um, we'll try and at least talk a little bit about what, what are they doing and, and what are the assumptions and things like that. Okay, so this one approach that's fairly simple is just pool all the data and fit a model that you might fit um, to an individual animal and then see if you can fix up the standard errors for inference. So let's think about this. What if, um, what if you treat all the observations as independent? What sort of problems might you encounter? What's, is there an issue with this? I'm curious what you guys think. So may, this is another chance to maybe just talk with your neighbor and see if you can come to a conclusion. What do you think? Do you think this is an issue? What if we just take all of those Fisher data and say, let's fit a model that says, does use depend on population density and elevation and just say, I'm going to pull everything together. What are, what are the potential issues with that? Yeah, talk to your, yeah, do, think pair share for a little bit. So what do, you, what do you guys think? Is this an issue? And why is it an issue? And what are, what are the sort of problems? Dan. I mean, when we were just sitting here chatting and we were talking about, you know, if you got two of those individuals happen to be together, then each other's location could be dependent on the, you know, the other, you know, as far as especially, like, we were thinking in terms of deer, that's what we're working on, but um, males can be in competition. So you've raised an even more challenging question. So most people are willing to assume in, in the individuals you've tagged are independently moving around. And you're, even, you're, you're suggesting, well, maybe that's even a poor assumption, that individuals may not be independent units because they may be reacting to each other, and you need to account for that. OK. That's re I mean, that's a good concern. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So that, I think that's a good point, is that part of the differences that you see at the population level really depend on characteristics at the individual level, and this is kind of ignoring that. So you're kind of, you're losing the ability to explain some of the variation maybe that's due to what individual animals encounter on the landscape. Any, any other points? <coughs> Roland. Could have uh, 100 million points for one animal. Yeah, so essentially you might be really weighting the data towards those individuals that have a lot of data. Yeah, so that's another potential issue. Yeah, I don't know if you did, like you had that one animal that, that had, didn't have a habitat type in its yep. character, and another one did. Yeah. 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 Like, yep. The availability and the, and the used, yeah. Used. Yep. Okay, those are all good points. Um, I like to think about like a thought exercise. So when I, sometimes when I, I teach some of the segment. It, it's in uh, Switzerland, and people are into 
soccer, football, call it what you want, right? We can have a debate on that as well, potentially. But let's say you want to quantify the amount of time that Americans versus Europeans spend watching football, soccer, same thing. We're going to say for now, same thing. Um, and let's say you follow different individuals, some for 35 days, some for 365 days, and you record each day whether they watched football or not, okay? Is this a problem? You know, and so part of Roland's point was, yeah, it is, right? So it can be a real problem. But are there times where it's not? Can anybody think where? When football's not on. When football's not on, then you're not going to get good data. Or it's the football is on every day. Football season is a few months, which is longer than 35 and shorter than 365, you have a problem. Yeah, yeah. But what if, yeah, so that's a good point. Like, if there, so, yeah, in the bag? Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. What do, you think, what do you guys think about that? What if your sample sizes were essentially balanced between Europeans and Americans? That'd be better, yeah. And I would say, yeah, use all those data. I mean, I think that would be a reasonable sort of thing to do in that case. So what this raises is that it depends on what's causing the differences in sample sizes. If it's completely random, and you have enough individuals, maybe it doesn't matter a whole lot that you've got variable sample sizes. Because on average, you should still be estimating the amount of time that Europeans watch football versus Americans. If there's not a bias towards you've got more Europeans providing data during time periods where football's on and not Americans or something like that, that's an issue. But if it's completely random, your sample sizes, then maybe it's not a huge problem when you're trying to look at a difference. So estimating what is the difference in the amount of time that, that they watch football. So you'll hear this a fair bit, this sort of conventional wisdom that non-independence sometimes doesn't matter in terms of when you're trying to estimate a parameter. So if you just pool the data and sample sizes are essentially random, maybe that's in, in some cases not super problematic, but the, the problem is maybe that you're, you're not able to characterize estimates of uncertainty real well, because if you, you have data that aren't independent, if you've got a lot of data from some individuals, that's different than having, so if you have 365 observations from one individual, that's very different level of information than if you have one observation from 365 different individuals in the population. So one of the problems is that trying to get an estimate of uncertainty can be problematic when your data are not independent. In reality, you need, uh, there's an assumption about missing data, which you can think about as the amount of data in this case, that it should be missing completely at random. Um, so if the sample size is completely at random, that wouldn't be a problem, but if, if people that really like football contribute more data, then that's a problem, right? Because then you're gonna be weighting your information towards those individuals that contribute a lot of data, and those individuals that contribute a lot of data are going to be different in a way that matters, okay? So this is an important point to think about. Um, one thing you could do is potentially subsample your data so you have equal amounts of data for each individual, and then maybe, maybe that wouldn't be such a problem just to pool all your data in terms of getting a good estimate about what's happening at the population level. And then you'd have to think about, well, how do I, how do I get estimates of standard errors that recognize that I don't have independent data? So that may be a, an option, is if you have roughly equal sample sizes for all of your individuals and you just are interested at what happens at the population level, one strategy is pool all the data and then try and get an estimate of uncertainty that recognizes that you've got these sample units that have multiple observations, if you're willing to consider that individuals are independent, right? If you're not willing to assume individuals are independent, then it's becomes a much more challenging problem. But if you assume your individuals are independent, then you could pool your data, estimate coefficients from one pooled model, and then you could do things like to get, um, to get an estimate of uncertainty, you could resample your individuals, refit the model, estimate the coefficients, do that many times. So essentially use what's called a bootstrap 
for inference. So you're, you're asking, what if I collected another data set with eight Fisher? How much would my estimates vary from data set to data set? So that's sort of what you try, try to capture here. By resampling individuals, you're trying to ask, how much would my coefficients vary if I got another sample of the same number of individuals? With eight individuals with highly varying amounts of data, this probably is not the best way to, to go about things. Um, and then the other thing to recognize is you're just concentrating on what happens at the population level. So we're not looking at how much variability there is from animal, animal to animal if you take this approach. You just pull all, all your data and fit one model. You're, you're lo you lose that ability to look at among animal variability and you're just treating that as sort of a nuisance. You have non-independent data. You know you've got to do something about it, but you're not necessarily interested in it. Um, so I, there's some R code that I put together here that takes almost two hours to run through these different options. So um, I'll eventually focus on just the HTML code, but this is, this is the sort of thing that you could do if you felt comfortable that you had about equal number of observations per individual and you had a large number of individuals. You could essentially resample your individuals. So you, this, this is what I would call a cluster level bootstrap. You're gonna resample individuals pull those data back together, you get data from the same individual, you may have, um, you may essentially duplicate their observations and then fit your resource selection function to those bootstrap data where you've recombined depending on what individuals happen to be in your bootstrap sample. Do this many, many times and then you could use, for example, quantiles of your regression coefficients to represent um, say a 95% confidence interval. You could use um, the, 0.20, the 0.025 and 0.975 quantiles to represent uncertainty in those coefficients. So in general, this is a useful strategy in some cases for dealing with clustered data where you've got relatively equal numbers of observations for each individual. Generalized estimating equations is another very similar sort of approach. You treat individuals as independent so um, they're a natural sort of extension of generalized linear models, so logistic regression or Poisson regression that deal with clustered data. Um, and again, you can get robust standard errors that are essentially treating the individuals as independent units when you get your estimates of standard errors. So another approach that sometimes is really useful for clustered data um, you could, in principle, fit these models. There's an R package called GEE pack that would let you fit GLMs. So it looks very similar to what we did yesterday. So GEE, GLM, you have your 0, 1 variable here, your covariates, family equal binomial. You have to represent uh, or recognize you've got some level of clustering. So this says individuals, I'm going to assume, are independent. Um, and there's different assumptions you can make about correlation within an individual. So here we've just said for the, for the purpose of getting estimates, I'm going to assume my observations are independent. Um, but I want robust standard errors that are calculated assuming individuals are independent and are, are independent sample units. Uh, there's also a way to do this with conditional logistic regression models fit with this Cox pH function you can add an argument robust equal true, and that will sometimes work. I tried implementing these with the Fisher data, and my computer crashed. So, um, so I'm not gonna illustrate those in the R file. Uh, here's an example of applying it to some moose data, and part of the point here is, you can see here are kind of naive coefficients, or standard errors, if you assume all the observations are independent. And if you treat the individuals as independent sta sample units, your standard errors are an order of magnitude larger, which is pretty common, right? So if you actually recognize your observations are not independent, this is, this is what you'll find. Like if you treat the data appropriately, you find there's a lot more uncertainty than if you treat all the data as if they were independent. Okay, so the, the next step would be to fit models to individual animals and then take those coefficients as data. And this is what we did yesterday and this morning, and to me, this is probably um, a great starting point. So it's, it's a fairly easy approach um, 
to implement and gives you some insights along the way that I think are really valuable. So advantages, very simple, easy to understand. Oftentimes, the answers you'll get from a two-step approach like this will be very similar to the answers you'd get with a mixed effect model. So this, this would go towards um, the recommendations. So you, when you have a reviewer, if you do a two-step process where you're fitting models to individual animals, and then you're taking the coefficients and summarizing them in some way, and your reviewer says you need to fit a mixed effect model, you could probably point back to it's probably computationally not feasible with your data set, which is probably tr probably very likely to be true. And then this is another, this is a great reference to back up this argument. So I really like this paper. This is a statistician at Oregon State. And he has an example where he says, back in maybe the early 90s, I analyzed these data. I was in, he was interested in, I think it was invertebrate communities and in, in, in lakes. And there were three lakes that had fish and three lakes without fish. And he had collected obser multiple observations at each lake. And he said, back when I first analyzed these data, I had this uh, repeated analysis, re repeated ANOVA with assumptions that the lower sample units were normally distributed and that the coefficient in this, it's like a paragraph and a half. And he says, at the time, I'm not even sure if I really understood what I was doing. Very complicated. Or I could boil my data down to a mean number of invertebrates at each lake. And then I had six data points, three in fish lakes with fish and three without, and I did a two-sample t-test, and I got the identical p-value. So the point being, your data, your information in your data about the differences between lakes with fish and without, your sample size is effectively those six lakes. So you could do this really complica complicated analysis at the level at which you collected your data, but your questions actually live at the level of the lake, and so you could do this really complicated analysis with more assumptions, or you could boil your data down to a summary statistic for each lake and then use those data to do something really simple. So I really like this paper because I think it's a, it's a powerful message and it's another, it's a good one to have in your back pocket when the reviewer says, no, you need to do something much more complicated and you try and it, your, it crashes R, or you sit there and wait for hours to fit a single model, which is what I was doing over the weekend to <laughs> try and prepare for this. So, I mean, it's a, good, um, it's a good reference to have in your back pocket. Okay, so what is this doing? If you do a two-step approach like we did yesterday and this morning, you can think about, I think it's important to be able to write down some of these models and think about them. So essentially, we fit models where we assume the importance of elevation, population density, and forest was different for each individual. So I represented those regression coefficients with three different Greek terms. So betas for the effects of elevation, gammas for the effects of population density, and taus for the effects of forest. And I gave them a little subscript I to say each individual has its own coefficient. All right, so we're assuming each individual has a different effect of elevation, population density, and forest um, on its observations. So step one would be to fit models to each individual animal and estimate those things, which is what we did in that R code yesterday and then today. So we've got now estimates of those coefficients for each animal. And then step two, we could characterize the distribution of those coefficients. We could look at their mean. We could look at their standard deviation. We could look at how those vary from animal to animal. Um, so if you're interested, is ma do males and females behave, move differently, you could explore whether those coefficients differ for males and females in step two. Uh, and to show another application, I want to introduce this idea of a functional response pattern, because I think this is another simple way to explore one of these, these questions about um, how do coefficients depend on what the animal experiences. Okay, so function, how many people have heard of functional responses in habitat selection, not like predator prey? Okay, that's cool. So almost no, no one raised their hand. Um, so let's think about this. Let's, let's assume that Fisher need, well, I, let's assume that your study animal needs a constant amount of water. So a, con a constant amount of some resource. What would you expect to see if you fit a model to each individual animal, 
and you plotted those coefficients as a function of the availability of that resource. So maybe you have some animals that live close to Lake Superior and others that live close to smaller lakes, and you fit a model to each individual animal, and you took those coefficients and you said, okay, I'm gonna plot those coefficients relative to availability. What would you think you would see? Try and think, you can chat with your neighbor, see if you can kind of come up, come up with an idea and what you'd expect to see if you implemented this two-step approach. You fit a model to each individual animal and then you said, I'm gonna take those coefficients and see if they depend on what was available to the animal. So does anybody want to, what do you guys think would happen here? Maybe a negative function of availability, the selection of density would just go down as the availability went up. Yeah, so as you get more water around you, but you're using a constant amount in these models, we're looking at use relative to availability. So your coefficient could actually go from something positive to negative depending on what your availability was. Yeah. Yeah. And the opposite side, if more is always better, and you're always going to use a constant proportion of some resource, then you would expect things to be fairly constant. So in some ways, looking, yes. Yes. 
across individuals yeah. or within an individual? Yeah, so here the idea is maybe you're getting different coefficients, but part of the reason is that those fish are live in very different landscapes. And maybe their behavior is actually pretty similar. They're using a constant amount of something, but the coefficients vary considerably because of the landscape they inhabit. So as an example, this, these, are, these are actually simulated data. I'll show a little bit of real moose data here in a minute. But um, if you had, had this situation where you needed a constant amount of a resource, and you had individuals with different amounts of availability, so some with a lot and some with less, you might expect something like this, right? So when you have very little of that resource, you have very little water around you, it looks like you, your coefficient's gonna be positive, it's gonna be large, it's gonna say you really like water. And if you have a ton of water around you, but you're still using that constant amount, it's really critical, um, you might have a negative coefficient that makes it look, you know, and if you interpret these things too literally, you'll say, oh, they don't like water. Well, no, they just, they don't need all of Lake Superior. They just need a constant amount, right? So I think this is an important thing to think about. Those coefficients depend on availability again, and those coefficients may vary if um, they need a constant amount of a resource. If more is always better, you might expect something like this, where the, the coefficients might be pretty flat across different availability. They're always going to use, they're going to drink 80% of the coffee that's, that's there, and they're going to leave the, you know, a Minnesotan will always leave one breadcrumb because they'll never, right? Am I right? How many, we got a lot of Minnesotans here, right? You'd leave the last breadcrumb, wouldn't you? Yeah, so um, anyhow. Okay, so functional response is, again, another very active area of literature. I try to just capture some references here if you're interested in this to kind of go, go read about it, but I think this is um, a pretty active area of research as well. And here's some, some data just from more than eight individuals. This was, these were data from moose and looking at the proportion of different cover types within um, their home range and looking at how coefficients depend on availability of those different land cover types. So here you can, you can see somewhat of a signal here that individuals with a lot of water tend to have negative regression coefficients and individuals with very little water on average tend to have bigger regression coefficients. So again, it's just kind of a simple way to get some insights <clears throat> into what might be driving among uh, individual differences. Each dot is an individual animal, different coefficient for um, a different, you know, so each of these is a regression coefficient from a different animal. So again, two-step process. Hey, have you ever tried doing something like a PCA on these analyses to see if there's clusters of animals that are kind of have it showing different behavioral syndromes? I haven't, but that would be very interesting to do, right? Um, to see if they cluster, you've got individuals that are doing very different things. And I, I know some people talk about like personalities for animals too. I, it's not my, I, I think it's really interesting, but it's not something I've worked on. But is there inherent differences, pheno, different phenotypes that might be expressed? Yeah. You can do whatever you want. That's, I, that's what I think is really beautiful about this, right? Is you now you just have a data set. You have a data set which each row is a different set of coefficients for a different individual. And so the PCA says, I know those coefficients are related to each other, right? So I want to I say, are there, <clears throat> are there individuals that have similar sets of coefficients? But um, you, could, you could do regression models, too, to say, um, does the coefficient for water depend on sex of the animal, the age of the animal, something like that? So yeah, you could, I mean, just think of this as a multivariate data set then, which I think is one of the, 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 the nice things about this is that you, you know, for someone like me that's um, more of a statistician, it's like put it in my wheelhouse and now I can do anything I do statistics on, right? This is just another data set, but it's a data set of coefficients, which I think is kind of powerful. I mean, I, I think this is, this is cool because we, we often deal with the, this issue that individuals could be variable. Right, you've got individual vari variability, and we usually can't measure it. But here, we actually we have the you know that's what this is. Each animal, and and sometimes you find that they're they're doing much different things, and maybe it's related to how much habitat they have, but maybe it's related to something else: male, female, old, young, bold, shy. Um, and 
just averaging them to say this is the average moose. Sometimes it's a horrible idea. We, we read this mountain goat paper where the mountain goats were all over the place in their habitat stuff. And if you averaged it out, it like ended up being zero. Um, and so uh, I think, you, like you said, you, now you have these variables, do some statistics on it, just taking an average, which is kind of like the first thing, like, oh, I want to get you know, mountain goats. That might not be the right thing to do because sometimes there is a lot of variability. And I think it's exciting to me that now we have these GPS tags that we can collect enough data that we can do these models individually, right? It used to be you wouldn't have, you had to chuck all the data together because it's the only way you had enough data to do a good habitat reference. But now you can do them per individual and, uh, and, and I think follow up with some really interesting biology questions at the tail end. Good point. Okay, you could do this, yeah, so you could ask any sorts of questions. Is it, are there differences in sex, age? Um, just treat this as another data set. The last part is mixed model. So if you do this, two-step approach, someone might say you should fit a mixed effect model. And if you look at the literature, there's tons of people fitting mixed effect models to study habitat selection. Um, and most of them will fit what I would call as just a random intercept only model. So they say, I, I have a random effect for individual. Um, so I'm going to account for non-independence by adding this random term. And essentially, all that's doing is saying the intercepts are different for each individual. But all those effects of elevation, population density, all your other covariates, it's assuming that that effect is the same for each individual, which it probably isn't. So um, it'd be better to fit what, what I would refer to as a random coefficient model, where each individual has its own regression coefficients. Okay? But people don't tend to do that. Um, and it's, it's sort of a problem, I would say. First of all, random intercept only models to me don't really do much in this context because the intercept's not something we're really interested in anyhow. It's really heavily influenced by how many available points you have for each used point. So the intercepts by themselves to me are not all that interesting. And then the other problem is just by including just a random intercept, um, the inference for those other habitat covariates that you might be interested in, like population density, elevation, forest, your standard errors are still going to be probably way too small for most of those. So if, if, that, that, if, if you have some variable that varies within an individual, like the population density that that fisher experiences, the, um, the elevation, and you don't include a random slope, uh, you don't allow the regression parameter to vary by animal, you're, you're going to have optimistic inference. So you haven't really, you haven't done much by including just a random effect for individual, just a random intercept. Although I would say that's incredibly common. So just, you could probably get away with it pretty easily, but it's probably not doing you much good, I'd say. So one thing to think about is uh, when, you, when you start to think about modeling data from multiple individuals, and in, in particular when you're trying to think about fitting mixed effect models, is thinking about those variables that you have, do they actually vary within an individual, or are they constant for an individual? Okay, so things like date, time, season, habitat, individuals are generally gonna experience multiple values of those variables. So that would be what I would refer to as a level one covariate, it's something that individuals have multiple multiple experiences on. And then there are some, some variables that may be constant for each individual, like sex, maybe age class, and those I would call a level two predictor. So it's something that is constant for an individual. For variables that vary within an individual, I would argue it's usually important to include random uh, a random effect so that you allow those parameters to vary by individual. And then the other thing to recognize is sometimes we have eight fisher, but tons of data on those fisher. If you want to look at sex specific, sex specific differences in these fisher, our sample size is eight, right? It's not that we've got 80 million GPS locations. We have eight fisher. So effective sample size for level two covariates is really the number of individuals you have. And that's an important thing to recognize, I think. Um, and you can't have a random slope effect for something like that. Like That makes less sense to think about. Each individual has its own effect of being male or female. 
um, usually that would be included without, without a, a random coefficient. So again, I'm going to have equations because I think it's important to be able to think about what models you're actually fitting. So um, I, I'm working with Johannes and, this, uh, and another statistician in Zurich um, writing a paper about how to deal with observations from multiple animals. And we've, as part of that, we did a lit review to see what people are doing. And most common, you just say, I, I had a random effect for individual. I have no idea what that model is. Um, it's probably a model that just has a random intercept. So again, each individual has its own intercept. And in, in our code, that would be something like uh, you would probably have elevation plus population density plus forest plus one, and then this bar and ID. So you would have, you would just basically be assu assuming each individual had its own intercept. In this model, this is a little complicated because um, first of all, I had, a, again, these models took a long time to fit, so they were taking a couple hours. And again, this is, this, so this is an area that uh, I'm actively working in with some, other, with, with some other folks and trying to develop computationally feasible methods for fitting these sorts of models. Uh, and it's probably not going to be using GLMER, which is the main fitting function you would use if you were going to do this in R. Okay. So here we've said, I want elevation, population density, and forest to, be, to also appear here, which suggests that I want those coefficients to also be unique for each individual. Okay? So the way I would write this model down is I would say, well, we're going to model each individual's density of used locations. And I would assume, like we did when we fit models to individual animals, that each animal has its own coefficient going with elevation, population density, and forest. And what mixed effect models do is they add another layer, another layer of hierarchy, another assumption. They're going to say, I'm going to assume that all of those regression coefficients together have a normal distribution. So if I look across individuals, I've got a bell-shaped symmetric distribution that describes variability from animal to animal in those coefficients. This model is a little complicated in that um, you actually have to think about those coefficients may also be correlated. So for an individual that really responds to elevation, they may respond less to population density. So you might think about there's often cases where those coefficients may be correlated. Okay? So this model assumes that those things might be correlated. And so the way I like to talk about that when I teach uh, mixed effect models is think about an individual walks through the door, and that individual is going to get a regression coefficient for each of these variables, for population density, for elevation, and for forest. And essentially, all those coefficients get assigned together. right? They don't get assigned independently because sometimes individuals that get a high coefficient for one might get a low coefficient for the other. You have to assign them together. So they all walk in, those coefficients walk in the door together. You get assigned all three at once. And so we actually have to have a multivariate normal distribution with a variance covariance matrix. And I know like, so when I teach this, the first time I throw these slides up, people cringe. And by the end of the semester, they, they're able to write down these models, which I think is really important to kind of communicate what sort of model you fit. But these models, um, this, these are what actually R is going to estimate are these different things down here. So if you look at the R output, which we'll look at in a minute, it's going to estimate what is the variability in the coefficients for elevation, the variability among animals. So it's going to estimate. How, how much that coefficient varies from animal to animal. It's going to estimate the variance of the population density coefficients and the forest coefficients. And that's also going to estimate how correlated those are. So individuals that tend to get a high value for the elevation coefficient, does it tend to get also a high value for the population density co uh, coefficient? Okay. So what R is actually trying to do is estimate these parameters down here. Um, which these ones are the same as, as up here. So you really have one, two, three, four, five, six parameters that capture among animal variability and covariability in their regression coefficients. And we have eight animals. So this is part of the problem with trying to fit this. We're trying to estimate variances and, and correlations with eight observations effectively. Okay? 
which is part of the challenge. Okay, so this is, the, I can't show all the regression output just in the slide, but we'll go look at the HTML code in a minute. Um, this is, so this is the piece that talks about the, the variability among animals. So you'll get these random effects. Um, you have a grouping variable, so ID, that says I've got variability among animals in the effect of forest, and this describes the variance in those individual regression coefficients. This describes the variance in the coefficients for elevation. This describes the variance of the coefficients among animals in the population density effect. And then these here describe how those parameters are correlated. Okay, so this one, I believe, describes the correlation between the coefficients for elevation and forest. This, oh boy, I'm not even 100% sure. Population forest and the other one would be yeah, population forest and population elevation, that's, that's my guess. But it's a fairly complicated model, and it's a very complicated model for eight individuals. So if you have a small number of in individuals, again, I think this, this model, I think, took over and it took an hour to fit. So whereas we, you could fit those coefficients for that model to each individual animal very quickly, right? Um, and you're fitting essentially the same model, only you don't have this extra structure that we're assuming that the coefficients are normally distributed. So you're kind of doing the same thing with that two-step approach. It's just very simple and very quick. And so that's why I, I actually tend to like it. Um, to, fit, to fit this model, one of the reasons it's so challenging is that it requires really complex optimization techniques. Um, effectively, it has to use numerical integration even to figure out what the likelihood is of the data. So you can't even write down an expression for what the likelihood is, and that may not mean anything to you, but just know it's, it's a computationally intensive method to try and get estimates. And then if you actually look at these data, so we have eight individuals and we're trying to estimate variances and covariances, and the, and the coefficients also don't look very normally distributed. So um, let's go back and look look at the RSF fits to the individual animals. It seems like this implies a certain level of humility that should be kept in mind. Yeah. Like modeling small numbers of individuals and trying to make in inferences about the species. Or That's one of the reasons I like the two-step approach, too, is it gives you a little humility, right? And, you know, it kind of it gives you those steps along the way and some intuition. For example, if, you, if, if we had just fit the model initially, um, the mixed effect model, you wouldn't know that there's an individual that never experienced forest. Here you do because it'll, it'll fail on you and you'll recognize, I've got an individual that never, never experienced forest. So that one's not contributing any um, to that information. So, and then you look at these coefficients, like if that guy wasn't there, maybe th this would look fairly normally distributed, bell-shaped and symmetric, but boy, that doesn't, so you, you have to make another assumption here that these coefficients, when you look across animals, they're normally distributed. And I'd say that doesn't necessarily look like a very good assumption. So again, there's sort of fewer assumptions when you fit models to individual animals and then take the coefficients as data. Um, it's not quite as elegant in that you don't get everything in one, one stop, you know, one model that summarizes one model to rule the world, but you'd have to wait a couple hours to get it. It's part of the problem. Um, the other thing is if you want to calculate, summarize, like how much variability is there among animals. So we got that, those estimates of how much these coefficients varied among animals. We got that directly from the mixed effect model. If we just calculated the variance of these coefficients, um, those estimates will be a little bit too big because these will vary because of true variability among animals, but also because of estimation error, measurement error. So technically, just calculating the variance of the covariant of the, the coefficients, that estimate will be a little bit too big on average. But I'd say that's probably not a huge um, factor, especially when you have a ton of data for each individual and we're getting into really big data sets with GPS. Um, I, don't, I think that's less of an issue. The other thing sometimes you hear about why mixed effect models are really nice is if you've got variable sample sizes and say you've got some individuals that don't have much data at all, your estimates of that individual's coefficients can be informed by data from other individuals. So because you fit this model that says individuals all have 
coefficients that come from the same population. You can share information across individuals. So sometimes you'll see that as a point for why mixed effect models are really nice, is you can get this information sharing. But if you have tons of observations like we have for each of these fisher, you probably don't need the information sharing. You've already got enough information to estimate these coefficients separately for each individual. So. There's a very common argument of pseudo replication of GPS data. You can turn it from every minute to 2,000 times a minute if you really collect more data. So, how does that relate to how you structure it? Yeah, so I would say um, one, thing, one thing to note is if you actually fit and you can get the model to fit as part of it, but if you can fit a model, where you have a random effect for each of these variables that vary within an individual. You're essentially doing the same. So we're gonna, we're gonna wrap this up quick. <laughs> You're effectively doing, doing the same. So the, so the answer I would say is if you can fit this model and you can get it to fit, this would, this would be, you'd be doing the same thing and it'd be reasonable. It'd be a, a reasonable way of addressing that pseudo replication. Um, same with fitting, if, unless you're Dan and you're worried that your individuals aren't independent. Then, and then it comes, dang it. Can we buddy breathe? Um, as long as you assume your individuals are independent, then fitting models to individuals, you know, even if the, so the, here's the other thing I like. So observations from the same individual aren't going to be independent. So observations close in time will be close in space. And if you just kind of want a, a summary for that, I want to summarize data for that individual. <laughs> And as long as my data are pretty systematically collected in space, maybe I don't care about the independence assumption so much when I want to just estimate that individual's coefficient. I can't get it standard error real accurately by assuming all those observations are independent, but maybe I'm willing to trust that the estimate of the individual specific coefficients is reasonable. But I don't really care about a confidence interval for an individual's coefficient. I want to look across individuals. So again, if I treat my individuals as independent, then that's okay, right? So then I have a coefficient for each individual, and if I assume my individuals are independent, I can just treat those as independent data for a second summary. So that kind of goes back to that paper by Paul Murtaugh about the lakes, right? So if you want to fit everything in one model, you may have to worry about those assumptions about independence within a lake. But if you boil the data down to one summary statistic at a lake, and lakes are independent, you've just made your problem a lot simpler. That's why I like it. Um, I don't know how long it's going to take to charge that. So there is an R file. OK, there is an R file that runs through some of this. So I did that cluster level bootstrap. Um, and you can see standard errors get much bigger when you actually recognize individuals are um, Observations within an individual are not independent. All right, let's see if we can get this. Well, it's not, it's black on my screen too. It's going to take a second maybe to warm back up. Point process models versus resource selection functions. I would say the the base um, point process model they're identical. With modeling point patterns, you can have clustering that you add on top of that. So then you you, you know by thinking about the model as a point process model versus just logistic regression, you open the door to to fitting 
um, models that also allow for additional clustering. So there, there are some advantages to thinking about the problem as not a binary problem, but as a point pattern. And that opens the door that if you can, you can fit other point pattern models that allow for clustering, you could do that. And I know there's, there is an R package called SpateStat that you could do some of that modeling. And I know there's a Bayesian package called INLA that lets you do, fit Bayesian models, hierarchical models, where you don't have to do MC-MC sampling. So it does it in an analytical way. And that's what we're trying to do. That's what I'm trying to work with um, Steffi Muff at University of Zurich and Johannes to try and illustrate how you can fit those models in INLA to do this sort of thing. So if you want to do everything in one stop, um, you might be able to do that in INLA. So that's where we're working. I'm hoping by this summer we'll have a paper ready to submit. And so if people are interested in that, I'm happy to send it out once we've got it. We're close. And can you, can you, put a spatial value effect you could, yeah. Yeah. So uh, on the, the, the two step versus one step, um, I get the, the, the one step where you mix it, put it all together in a mixed model is a lot more complicated, takes longer to run, is subject to having assumptions like data normality not met. So what's the advantage? Just that you would have sort of one species level equation? One model to, to get everything from. Okay. Reviewers will love it, right? You know, like that's why everyone's fitting GLMMs, generalized linear mixed effect models. They just say, I put a random effect for individual. And that and people th oh, say, oh, you've, you've treated correlate, you, you've dealt with correlation, so yeah, that's fine. But I think they don't realize by just adding a random intercept, you're probably not dealing with that correlation so, very so well. So was, was the model that, that you were showing, was that just adding the random intercept, or was that like That was adding variable? all of those slopes. Okay. So in the R code, I fit just the random intercept model, and you can see the standard errors for several of the coefficients are still really small relative to what you should probably expect. Right. Okay, so part of the challenges here computationally get much worse when you deal, when you move into the step selection literature. So if you want to fit the conditional logistic regression models, those are really, really difficult to fit computationally. So that's really where the in-law has a potential advantage. Um, so here there's actually uh, an R package for fitting the step selection models in a two-step approach. Um, so this two-step C logit package will, will formally do this two-step approach where it'll fit models to individual animals and then estimate means and variances of those regression parameters across individuals in a very formal sort of way. So um, that may be of interest to some. And then, like I said, where I'm working with some other folks on trying to develop an approach using in-law, and my hope is that by the summer we'll have a paper on that that we can share. So to summarize, what are your options? Well, one is you could fit models to pool data, um, particularly if you've got equal numbers of observations for each individual and you're just interested in kind of overall patterns. Like, so where are these indiv individuals most likely to be found? Um, and then you could, you could do something like a cluster level bootstrap or something to get honest estimates of uncertainty. So that's, that's one approach. You can fit models to individual animals and then treat the, treat the estimates as data, so a two-step approach, which I tend to, to like myself quite a bit. Um, or you can try and fit mixed effect models and do everything in one step, but that can be um, pretty challenging. So let me, um, let me pull up the R code that kind of looks at some of this for the, the Fisher data. So here's the, the cluster level bootstrap that was in the set of slides, but again, it's resampling individuals and then um, forming a new data set that has some individuals represented multiple times. And then um, looking at the mean estimates across these different bootstrap samples and the standard deviation of those estimates across bootstrap samples, which would be your standard error. So, um, standard error is, so this is one of the things I 
I recognize from teaching my grad level class. Like, what is a standard error? Who feels comfortable with it? What is a standard error? Everyone looks down. Um, I would probably too after, after my first undergrad stat class. So what you were trying to capture here is if you went out and collected another eight Fisher, and you estimated the same, you fit the same model. You get a different set of estimates, right? For every different eight Fisher you might get, you'd get a different set of regression parameters. And so in a frequentist world, you have to envision being able to do that over and over and over. So think about replicating the process of collecting a new data set, same size as the original one, fitting the same model, getting the same estimates, doing that an infinite number of times or many, many times. And then if you looked at the distribution of those estimates across different possible samples, you would get the sampling distribution. So that tells you how much that regression parameter would vary from sample to sample if you collected another data set. And the standard deviation of that sampling distribution is your standard error. So bootstrapping tries to mimic that process by saying, well, what if I got another sample of eight Fisher? So it says, I'm going to take those eight Fisher and treat that, those data as an estimate of what the population would look like. So now I've got a population I could sample from. So I'll sample from those, those, my sample data with replacement, and that'll mimic getting a new data set. So you take a sample with replacement fit your model, take the coefficients, do that many, many times, and then if you calculate the standard deviation of those coefficients, you're getting a standard error. So that's essentially what these are trying to replicate. It's probably not a great idea with just eight individuals, but um, just the, the idea is what I want to represent here. You can see I, I blocked out the GE GLM because it caused my program to fail. Um, so to get to Roland, your question about the random intercept, this is, this is the model you would most often see. So you would just say use or available, and you'd put in your different coefficients, and you'd put in one with a bar ID and say I put a random effect of, for individual, okay? And you see this all the time, I, and, and probably described in words as just I had a random effect of individual. Um, and if you look at the output there, you'll see you still have incredibly significant regression coefficients. And these aren't assumed to vary by individual. But the intercept is. So now up here, this random effects part, we have one term. So here's the variance of the intercept. So all we've done is said, I think the intercept varies from animal to animal. But the effect of elevation, population density, and forest, I'm assuming is constant. So so it's like you've pooled all the data when you estimate these coefficients and their significance. You're really not buying yourself a whole lot in this case by having a random intercept. And um, I've, I've actually seen a number of cases where just adding a random intercept, you'll see the variance is zero in some cases because really it's a lot largely driven by your number of use, used points versus available points. And what you often see people do is take an equal number of use points or equal number of available points to use points for each individual. And so in some cases, you may find the, the intercepts don't actually even vary a, a whole lot. Um, it's not quite that simple, but I mean, it's, that's, that's all it's, this model is doing is it's saying that each individual has its own intercept. But these coefficients are, are consistent across individuals. So meanwhile, while, while I was trying to fit these things and they were taking forever to fit, I found that there's a packet, our package, what is it called? Called TikTok, which is really cool. Because then you can put things like tick, and you can put any name you want, and then you put talk at the end. Did, did they? They probably did, yeah. Well, steal whatever you can that works, right? So here you can see this took 250 seconds. So this, that's the random intercept only model. Um, and then there's the model that I showed in the slides where we had the effect of forest elevation and population density. We had those as random coefficients for each individual. And that model took 4,000 seconds. So um, takes a long time to fit. And then the other thing was I was trying different things out here in terms of the specification either including the weights or not including the weights. Ideally, I'd like to include the weights, 
And sometimes like it wouldn't converge. So sometimes the model fitting uh, algorithm didn't work at all or, or didn't think that it had converged on parameter estimates. So again, it was, it was a little touchy to try and get, get the model to fit. So um, I was doing a little bit here at the end, and, and I'll admit that I didn't, uh, didn't really flush this out really well. But here are, the, here are the estimates of the different coefficients for each individual animal that we got yesterday. And you can get similar sorts of things from the, the model we fit here by typing ran EF for random effects. And um, these describe essentially the variability about the mean. So they're, they're not directly comparable. I don't believe. I think, um, I think you have to add back in these fixed effects. So mixed effect models would be a lot to cover today too, but essentially where you can, you can specify the model two ways. You can say my coefficients um, are normally distributed with means here and variance here, or you can say I've got some fixed effects and then I've got random effects that describe deviations from the mean that are normally distributed with mean zero and the same variance. And so I'm, I'm almost positive that these are describing differences from the mean. And that may or may not mean a lot to you, but um, I think the bottom line is that here's two different ways to approach the same sort of problem. One that I think is very simple, doesn't take a lot to understand, right? Fitting models to individual animals is not that difficult to conceptualize. Um, and you, you should get similar sorts of, you're fitting similar sorts of models. So you should get, should get ideally similar sorts of answers if the models are working well, okay? So uh, would you expect this, even though they're, they're different, would you expect the signs to be yeah, you similar? Know, and they're not in some places. Again, so. I, I, this, was, this was being done over the weekend with two hours at a time. Let me ch change something. So I'm hesitant with this, partly too, because you have eight individuals. So again, I think the model's just, the model that you'd want to fit is too complex. Like we'd ideally like to have all those parameters vary by individual. We want to be able to estimate those variances and those covariance, but with eight individuals, that's, that's just asking too much. And those, those coefficients don't look normally distributed. So I, I think that has some, like this guy and that guy, I think that has some effect on this too. So again, I guess I just don't trust that mixed effect model a ton. And I feel very comfortable with the fits to the individuals, that that's a simple way to boil things, things down. Yeah, Alex. Yeah, so I think this come, comes down to, in my mind, again, how you approach model building. And there's different approaches. There's some people that say, I'm going to look at every possible model and combination that I could possibly consider, and I'm going to find the best model that I can fit to my data. And if you, your inference is always going to be very optimistic there. Like, you're going to overfit your data if you have a ton of covariates, and you're really kind of, you're trying a bunch of different things. You're going to find a model that fits your data really well, and it's probably going to predict new data really poorly. And again, this is something you could teach a whole semester on, is like, how do you approach model building? And people have very different views. My personal view is I would say, we have eight Fisher, so if you really want to capture a, you know, like the, you have a lot of data for each individual. So you can fit kind of rich models there, but you don't, you know, like if you want to look at differences between, like what, between animals in terms of sex or age, you don't have a lot of information there. But within an individual, I would say, well, um, let me think about how big of a model is too big. 
I, you know, I think about how much data do I have for each individual, what's a reasonable model to fit for that? And then I'd say, okay, if I feel comfortable with having six predictors, let me think about what those are before I look at any data, ideally. And so I would try and come up with an a priori model. This is how I'd approach it. Say it's six predictors and I'd fit that model and I'd be done. And I'd summarize all the coefficients. Some might have big effects, some might have small effects, but I would be looking at all those covariates that I thought were important enough to include, and I wouldn't use model selection to tell me which are important or not. I would use this, the effect size to tell me which ones are important or not. And then you also have the benefit of saying, is there a lot of uncertainty or not? So that's how I would approach it. I'm not a big fan of doing a ton of model selection because there are some issues with that. Now, there are issues with what I suggested in that you may, you may not look at some covariates that are really important. You eliminate them a priori. But I would say, if you really want to do good science, try and have really good questions up front that, you know, ideally, you're not, your, your questions don't involve what set of predictors are most important. Like that's a challenging problem to really make a lot of progress. But let's say you're really focused on what's the effect of population density. So like I, I know that's a, that's a, then you're in pretty good shape because you say, I really care about population density. Let me put in as many other things as I think are important to adjust for other things that are, I need to account for so that I get a good estimate of this. And then you can say, does it matter if I include or exclude a couple other things? And my answer to my question doesn't matter. That's, I, that's, that's your ideal situation. Yeah. The only you're actually yeah. Yeah. And then after the fact, you could say, okay, I want to look at everything else. I'll fit a bunch of other models. But if I find something that's really significant there, like I find they really care about elevation, but a priori, I didn't think that was going to be important. I would report it, but then at least you kind of recognize that you discover it's a data driven discovery, right? So I, I like to try and separate those two things out. So you have an a priori hypothesis that's hopefully very focused. And maybe you do a sensitivity analysis to say, does that question, answer to that question change depending on what else I include in the model? And then go ahead and open it up and say, what else can I find? But then think of that as more hypothesis. Uh, you're, you're, you're driving some hypotheses that someone else should collect some new data and see if they hold up. So you would write a paper like that? I would. Yeah, I mean, that's the argument I make all the time. And you know, I see that's But if you not find out like in the end, oh, elevation, it turns out was, more important, and that's more interesting than what we originally did, but you would sort of have that as a side. If you want to be honest, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, as a statistician, so, I mean, that's the challenge we have in academia, right? You got to sell what you do, and that's not going to sell as well as, wow, we found this really, really unique finding, but why do you think we're jumping all over the place, right, in terms of, you think of public health where they have better control of things, they have big data sets often, and one day it's good to take a vitamin C and the next day it's not and, you know, other things, you know, like there's so many, I mean, that's the, the whole replicability crisis right now. People are finding, take the top 10 papers in some of these journals, you can't replicate any of the results. And part of that is because it's data driven, non a priori, look at enough things, you're going to find something significant. I mean, you hear these things all the time, like there's a Republican always elected after the Redskins won the, the previous game. I remember that one. There's all these sorts of things. If you look at enough stuff, you're going to find interesting results that aren't going to hold up. So you can, I don't know, that's my, my little rant as a statistician is like, I, I would rather publish less, well, ideally publish less or more truthful and have the results that you publish be replicable than to come out and say, this thing's really awesome. And then more than likely it's not going to replicate. But that's a challenge. I don't, you know, Yeah, probably. <laughs> I mean, if it was a, if I, if, if it made, if it made biological sense and like, I, I feel like sometimes there are patterns that we don't, we wouldn't have expected that we find. And if it's in the data and it makes biological sense and it's supported and it's something that I think, yeah, I mean, if I think that it, it wouldn't be replicate, if, that it wouldn't be replicatable for some reason, then, then I for sure wouldn't. But, um, I think there are, I, I'm more of a data miner in, in philosophy and, and more think that there are, there are things that, that we don't think of that can show up in the data. And I think, um, I mean, you don't want to stretch it too thin, but I think 
in this world where there's tons of data and it's easy to make lots and lots of comparisons, you're not always going to think of everything ahead of time. Um, so it, it's a little bit of a, um, uh, it, it is sometimes, I mean, I've, I've gone in other times with, you know, very specific objectives and, and variables and we, we just sort of stick with that and we don't do all the rest of it. I guess that's kind of more, I guess, and there's a between you could split your data and yeah. say I'm really going to mine it in this half and see if it holds up in the second half or I found this really cool finding let me find another similar species does it happen again I mean it, I, I think in in what I've what I've actually done it's sort of more like we have this we had the initial things that were the answers that we're trying to get and we get those answers and then <clears throat> maybe later we explore some other variables and we find something else and then that kind of becomes another another uh, do two papers I guess mm -hmm. not sure. And part of, part of that comes from, you know, as a st I've worked with a lot. So I, my before coming to the university, I worked for the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, a wildlife research statistician with a group of 20 scientists, probably 15 PhD level scientists, and then some master's level scientists. And I mean, the conversations, I've had them where you go, um, they're, they're explaining, well, the, the effect is this because, and it, there's a story that goes, and then you go, well, the, the coefficient's actually the opposite sign. They go, oh, yeah, yeah, no, that's because, and they come with a completely different story. <laughs> and it's always useful if you have two stories, one for one way that the data shake out, one for the other way. But um, yeah, it's, it's, that's, it's a I think that's a challenge sometimes, so. Over to uh, the uh, the other part of the museum on the second and the 